All right, let's get our other Facebook groups in here before it's officially time to go. And we got our spinning wheels coming in here, saying one and two. Welcome in, welcome in, everybody. It is Tuesday night. It's time for an episode of Building the Broncos. I put on the wrong hat, Carl. It shows how late I was running there. Um, but uh, it's Tuesday, and I'm joined by Carl Dummler, as always, on these Tuesday night shows. Carl, how you doing? Uh, welcome to, you know, free agency combine number seven for us, number eight for us. What is it? I think seven. Okay. I think. Lucky number seven. See, we got John Elway year. This is our year. Oh, man. We're, well, we're depending finally on who you ask. Good. I know. <laughs> Everybody knock on some wood here. Uh, no, I'm good, man. I'm doing great. And like I said, it's kind of the, the calm before the storm. We're already starting mm -hmm. to see some incredible things happen around the league. And uh, keep waiting for the Broncos to make a big move. And, of course, they, they made their, their biggest move of the offseason, signing Humphrey at wide receiver. Lil Jordan, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, Lil Jordan. Be... Lil, you can't so, you know, everybody no get pumped. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. So yeah. no, it's like I said, it's calm before the storm. Next week is when we get that. Is it Monday? The legal tampering period opens up. I believe so. And so, like, get ready for all this. Uh, there's going to be a lot of news over these next few days. Of course, some cuts coming through, maybe mm -hmm. a trade or two, all those kind of things. But you know, so I think tonight we might be talking about a couple things the Broncos might be doing coming up. And some things maybe to get excited about, maybe to be worried about. I'm not quite sure. And uh, But yeah, I'm excited to talk tonight with y'all. Yeah, we got Dylan Von Arks coming in saying, Sup Broncos Country, make sure you guys hit that like button on the way in. Share and subscribe if you haven't already. We got our guy Rick coming in here saying, Sean Payton's great at finding skill players, late rounds, undrafted free agent. Kamara, Tifton, Colston, Hofstra, free agency and draft Broncos should be trench-oriented. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, he can find good guys. I will say Kamara was a very early third-round pick because I had him mocked late third round of the Broncos that year. And I'd really mm -hmm. liked him rather than trading up for Christian McCaffrey, like a lot of people wanted to do, but uh, yeah, yeah. They have been able to find some good talent, no doubt. And they've invested heavily in uh, the offensive and defensive lines with the saints. Yep. I, I was doing some research earlier today about this and, and we'll get into this conversation a little bit more about maybe some free agent moves Broncos to make, but we got David Yunkin coming in saying, I still would lo love to see five receivers on the for a couple of plays. Oh, on, on the field for a couple yeah. of plays. Yeah. Um, I, I'm sure we're going to have some of that. Sean Payton is one of the more diverse when it comes to uh, the different formations that he wants to put out there because he wants to, especially early in games, he wants to kind of test what formations make life difficult for the other teams. Do they struggle against three wide, four wide? Do they struggle against two tight ends? It's why well, like, he loves they, having, what are their oh, responses to that? Yeah. Right? Like if he sees, Oh, you're playing this coverage against this. I'm going to come back to that. You you showed your hand. I know the matchup I want from that one. Sorry, continue. Yep. Yep. Right, you're exactly right. And and so it's why he loves having a variety of weapons that he can put on the field. You know, it's why he's he's very much invested, like I said, offensive line, but also you see within the weaponry as well. The wide receivers trying to get them going. A couple running backs, always wanting at least two running backs that can get on the field and bring high-quality snaps for you. So... You know, there's going to be a lot of moves the Broncos are going to have to make to to fit what he wants to do of how he wants to try to attack teams in that way. But we got Dominic Martin coming in saying, uh, or Dominique, sorry. Uh, hey, Broncos family, I'm curious as everyone, does the new wide receiver signing mean a trade soon? MHH for life, Broncos forever. So I, I teased this a little bit in our group chat that, you know, of course, Broncos go sign a six foot four wide receiver. That has to mean. Something's coming up with Sutton. I, I really don't think so. I don't think this has much to do with Sutton. It's more of just he has a familiarity with, with Sean Payton. He was on the open market. He's kind of a, a camp body that maybe makes your team if there's a couple injuries. Maybe if you do trade Sutton. I, I don't think you do this because you're going to trade Sutton. I think you do this as more of just, hey, we need as many bodies as we can get in the locker room. Yeah, and little Jordan Humphrey, he's a big slot, essentially. He's not really got he's got the big body, but it's not the prototypical X. He's essentially a move tight end uh that they will use in the slot and run inside zone with him being the crash down uh wide receiver helping in the blocking scheme. So he helps a lot in the red zone. Big slot, uh, essentially what he was uh, during his time at Texas and so far in the NFL. I think good to see you, Dominique. Hope you're doing well. Also, we got Jesse saying Atlanta didn't tag Caleb McGarry. Really hoping Denver is smart enough to get him in the second. They are allowed to. Would be a huge addition to our offensive line. Caleb McGarry, uh, if you've listened to any of the shows with uh, Scott Kennedy and myself, Scott is a big Atlanta fan. 
Before this year, Caleb McGarry was the bane of Scott's existence, uh, despised the guy, you know, thought he was a massive bust. And then this year he played pretty well. So I will say that it's kind of the Garrett Bulls, uh, you know, contract year, all of a sudden he figures it out. Maybe he has figured it out, but I will say I'm a little bit skeptical or I would be trepidatious. Is that even a word? Uh, the, mm-hmm. You know, just kind of holding yourself off about crowning McGarry because of that Atlanta offense. They didn't have tr- many true dropbacks this last year in their offense. They really protected him. And also he plays against arguable uh, plays next to arguably the best guard in all of football this last year in uh, Chris Lindstrom as well. So I think McGarry is a good player, especially as a run blocker. Uh, he can do power gap scheme stuff or outside zone, but in the drop back pass game, I don't know if he's a Island level offensive tackle. I think you need to help him a lot. Now I'm not against paying him, but I also don't think he is, you know, top 15 offensive tackle money uh, worthy in my opinion. And he's probably going to get paid that because second contract hitting the market. Right. No, I'm with you there. And you're right. They ran the heck out of the football there in Atlanta. They played to his strengths. Now I'm hoping the Broncos run the heck out of the football again this year just to kind of help Mm -hmm. Russell Wilson and that offense get a little bit of rhythm and kind of cover up some of the deficiencies at the quarterback position. But I'm with you. I'm a little bit leery about that one. I do love McGrary and I loved what he showed this last year. It's just, you are putting a little bit of hope that he's going to continue to develop as a player. Mm -hmm. You know, those first three years, like you said, pretty crappy player out there. All of a sudden has that one good year. Are you really really willing to bank that that's what he's going to be moving forward and better? And so we got Mike S saying, what's up, Nick, Carl, Scott, Dylan, and Broncos country. Good to see you, Mike. And we got Riptide saying, please, please, please sign Kareem Hunt evening MHH. And that kind of sets up a little bit of our our conversation for the evening on some some free agents that the Broncos might be linked to. And one that they are heavily linked, linked to is Kareem Hunt running back from Cleveland. If I know a lot of Broncos fans kind of remember back in 2017 when he was drafted by the Chiefs, had himself quite the rookie season. Uh, trying to, I think he was he offensive rookie of the year that year. I don't remember if he was, but he was really good for them. Uh, first year, third round pick out of Toledo. Yeah. And man, yeah, heck of a running back, all around player, can run, catch block all those things that you need him to do but then of course we had the he had the incident off the field that you have to keep in mind with all of that that comes with them and we got kevin gray saying evening broncos country nick carl and scott i don't know what happened this morning i started trying to get to building uh, or uh broncos for breakfast started at seven and gave up at eight not sure what all happened there there must be an issue with something we were there um we were on, we were live. There's a lot of people in the chat. So some other people have said they've had some issues with uh, getting on chat. So we're welcoming you here, but if that doesn't work, check Facebook, uh, check the Twitter account. Uh, I, I don't know, but uh, we were here, um, but coming yeah. back to cream hunt. Yeah. You mentioned it. He had the altercation where he assaulted a 19 year old in a Cleveland hotel. Uh, it resulted in an eight game suspension. And with the chiefs releasing him, he hasn't had an incident since, but obviously they're going to have to do their due diligence on that. I had heard that the Broncos were pretty, once the Deshaun Watson uh, stuff came out this last year before they were pursuing him, once that kind of really came out, they're like, nope, not for us. Uh, Kelly Klein, a big part of that in the Broncos front office, you know, really being a no on the uh, sexual assault stuff. So, uh, you know, we'll see how it plays out. Uh, the big thing, though, is it's a connections league. We've talked about that before in the Broncos new running back coach, uh, Lou Ayenu. Uh, Ayeni? Uh, Ayeni. Ayeni. Lou Ayeni uh, is the uh, former running backs coach for Kareem Hunt at Toledo. He was also the main recruiter in uh, Kareem Hunt coming to Toledo. So you have a connection there. We also have some comments. Uh, Mike S saying I'd rather have Montgomery from Chicago, also a three down back. Uh, Ianni also recruited David Montgomery to Iowa state. Uh, so that's right. been his path and heck might as well connect us to Evan hole as well. Right. Northwestern running back uh, this year. Cause that's where I, he's coming from uh, for the Broncos this year out of Northwestern. But I'd be surprised if the Broncos didn't bring in one of those three backs this off season, given the familiarity and also just the need and the fit uh, with all three. Right. Uh, I know. Did you see uh, Melvin Gordon's comment earlier th- today? They were, they were talking on one of the shows about not, um, or of going out there and getting a, a star running back. I think it was Derek Henry. And he was like, well, if they have forgotten about number 33 and they're already ready to dismiss him. No, that's not the case. It, it's, 
how much can you really bank on him being much this year? It's kind of like the idea of, I know a lot of people in the comments have seen, Hey, just draft a late round guy, you know, be like the chiefs, take Pachinko in the seventh round and he's going to turn into something. Yes. Running backs. You can find a lot of talent throughout the draft and running backs a little bit are a dime a dozen in some capacity, but you can't bank on that rookie to be your guy this year. If you actually expect the Broncos to be able to do something this year, you can't expect that they're going to go get a, a pachinko in the seventh round. You know, that, that's just, that's playing with fire there. If you're planning on that being your, your plan at the running back position. It can be a part of your plan, but it can't be the plan. It needs to be a multi-pronged approach to the running back. And the reason we're talking about Kareem Hunt is uh, Matthew Barry, a uh, longtime ESPN uh, fantasy reporter, NFL insider as well, down at the Combine. I needed an article, now working for NBC Sports, uh, about 23 tidbits of information he picked up from the Combine. And one of them was he linked the Broncos to Kareem Hunt. And the main reason they're being linked to a running back is because Matthew Barry essentially said that the Broncos are letting on or not, not being truly honest with how worried they are about Javante Williams knee and his health and that the range of outcomes for him this year, he could be ready week one, uh, but he might take weeks. He might not even play the entirety of 2023. They don't know right now. We're talking six, seven months away. You couldn't know right now. So George Payton coming out on the press conference saying, Oh yeah, he's jogging. We expect him to be ready week one. Matthew Barry is saying that doesn't mean one blip uh, Uh because it's so far away. We don't know. And uh, the Broncos are probably going to be aggressive and bring in some running backs like Peyton did say uh, in his press conference. Yeah. And and Sean Peyton has always been, he wants two almost starting quality running backs mm-hmm. on his roster usually because he, he just wants to, again, be multiple and he wants to be able to send wave after wave of playmakers onto the field for a defense that usually a lot of those secondary players, linebackers, stuff like that, a lot of them play most snaps in the game. Yeah. So you're kind of hoping, hey, I get these fresh legs out there Good luck. It's, it's kind of like what Cleveland has been doing with Nick Chubb and, and Kareem Hunt. Like, okay, you just had five plays against Nick Chubb. Now we're going to bring in Kareem Hunt. Good luck out there. And so that, that's exactly what he's kind of wanting to bring out there. And I, I know I've seen Latavius Murray. Some people have talked about him in here. Yeah, he did pretty good for the Broncos this last year. But again, he's he's 32. <laughs> that's, and he doesn't bring that's anything a, to the run, the receiving game. Right. Like nothing. Yeah. He has a role, but and he could be brought in for close to vet men and compete at camp. That's essentially the, what you're talking about right now. But going into next season with Murray as your number one, that was like break glass in case of emergency. He picked him off of a practice squad last year. Right. He played well, but you know that's that's not a great strategy for a team that's going to be extremely dependent on the run game with Russell Wilson. I mean, you, you even heard Sean Payton talk about it. Get Russell Wilson off that high dive by building a more complimentary offense and rushing the football more. Uh, and that's probably, you can have Murray as a part of that, but it can't be the only uh, part of that solution. So Heath Holmes, want to say hello to some people coming in here. Uh, says, even Nick and Carl, good teams have uh, to part ways with expensive players sometimes. We may lose Draymond Jones, but as a team, healthier. Chiefs were good, but stayed good when they didn't pay Hill. Yeah, they traded Hill. Uh, before they had to let him at free agency. So, Carl, I mean, I guess I got to ask you with the news coming down of the, and thank you so much for the comment, Heath. Uh, we appreciate you. Uh, was it a misstep, a uh, miscalculation by the Broncos front office not trading Draymond Jones during the trade deadline this last year and they traded Chubb? Uh, because now you might have to let him walk and maybe for nothing, you might not even get a comp pick for him. Yeah, so if if they if they get nothing in this whole process and they don't get him re-signed, then yes, this was a huge mistake on their part to, it it was already a sinking season. That's why you were willing to trade Bradley Chubb. And part of that reason that most people thought was, okay, yeah, they're going to keep Draymond Jones beyond this season. You know, you can't pay both of them. So at least trade one, be able to sign the other. And now it just seems that has kind of gone out the window too now. And so I, I do think the Broncos had a misstep in this situation, maybe miscalculated what his value would be on the open market. Yep. Um, maybe thought he would be a lot more open to, to signing with the Broncos. And and I, from what I've heard, he is willing to give the Broncos a little bit of a discount to stay here, but they're still not even willing to come up to the discount. And they're just playing hardball with a guy that I think is pretty much like, you want to play hardball with me? That's fine. I'll go mm-hmm. get my bank somewhere else. I'll go make that extra two, $3 million a year somewhere else. And so, yeah, I, I I don't like what they're doing with this. The only thing that could maybe save them in this situation a little bit is the fact that, like I said, I've said before, this defensive line free agent class 
some pretty decent names out there. I think they can get a guy for maybe 50% of the cost that brings maybe 75% of what he could bring to the field. Yeah, you hope so. Uh, they yeah. obviously will see how the scheme works out and everything and how the edge workers work, work out as well. I mean, once Bradley Chubb was traded, Draymond Jones's production went down as well. So we'll see how it plays out uh, for the Broncos. But we got our guy Cody W coming in, helping with the Super Chat. Thank you so much, Cody. I was wondering if you guys loved us. Anyone? Hey, anyone alive out there? Cody, Orlando Brown Jr. wasn't tagged by the Chiefs. Hmm. Orlando Brown Jr. Carl, what do you think? Chiefs letting Orlando Brown walked after trading a first-round pick for him two seasons ago. Uh, obviously, the, he was uh, drafted in the third round by the Ravens, uh, played right tackle for them. Ronnie Stanley got hurt. He flipped over to left tackle and said, hey, I am not going back to right tackle. If you're going to put me at right tackle, trade me. So he mm -hmm. ends up then being traded to the Chiefs for a first round. Pretty good there. Uh, I think he gave up the most pressures in the entire NFL last season. Now, granted, we talked about McGarry last year being helped by the scheme. I think Orlando Brown was put in a harder situation by the scheme and how Mahomes plays football. So yeah. I, he's still a good tackle despite that number. Uh, but I think that information is part of the equation, though, when you're talking about potentially paying Orlando Brown Jr. Uh, 20 plus million a year. I, I'm with you there. I, I don't think he was a great fit for the Chiefs. Yeah. We, we talked about it when the trade was made. He's coming from the most run heavy offense to the most pass heavy offense. And there's going to be some struggles there. He He's yeah. made to be a downhill, I'm going to take your head off kind of thing, kind of guy. Mm -hmm. And if you're asking him to be a blocker for, you know, in the past game for 45 snaps a game, you're asking for him to give up some pressure in that situation. Yeah. And so I, I know a lot of people have been kind of hoping the Broncos maybe trade Bulls and then go sign Orlando Brown. I'm not really a big on that idea. You know, yeah. again, like I said, he's wanting some huge money. I think that's part of why the Chiefs have been like, I'm sorry, we got to let you go, bud. Mm -hmm. And we'll let somebody else overpay for the talent that you bring. He He's talented. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But I, I would put him in that good category where he's won that great money. Yeah. And so I don't blame the Chiefs for doing this. And they might get a third round comp pick back for this. The, the Chiefs have been one of the best teams of getting comp picks. You know, it helps when you're a great team. And you're winning a lot of games, gets your players recognized, kind of gets them overpaid sometimes. Broncos had that when they were winning back in 2012 to 2015. But a decade ago. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know it's, it doesn't feel like that. But yeah. anyway, so I, I would pass on Orlando Brown for the Broncos at this point. Yeah, right now, my, I think my favorite tackle, and we'll see what the market dictates. But if obviously medicals are big here, but. Jawan Taylor is probably my mm -hmm. favorite for the Broncos at right tackle. Uh, good athlete, really long, and seems a little bit underrated, underwhelming, uh, or uh, underrated compared to the other guys. We got our guy Paul coming in saying hello. Nick, Carl, and Scott and chat. Hit the like button. Thank you so much, Paul. Yeah, you guys hit the like button coming in. Uh, we also got 999 coming in. Dark Iron uh, D-I-X-K coming in. I don't want to know if I want to say that last one, but uh, Dark did coming in here, 999. If you have any questions for us, did uh, we appreciate that. We'll get to you, but uh, if it's just a 999 being supportive, uh, we really do appreciate that. Uh, hope you're doing well. And uh, like I said, if you have any questions, say hello. Um, did want to say, Paul, yeah. good to see you, Paul. Larry, no filters. What's up, guys? Brad D saying, happy Taco Tuesday. God, tacos sound great. Uh, mm -hmm. Michael Ronquillo, good evening. Nick and Carl on building the Broncos. Go Broncos and buck them. We appreciate you. Yeah, and the uh, Facebook user saying, good evening, Nick, Carl, and Scott in Broncos country. Happy birthday to Scott's wife. Yeah, Scott's not here, guys. Uh, Scott is off being a good husband. So it's just Carl and I, you know, old school, messing around with you guys, having right. a good time. Talking about old school, Chase Wellner, BTB. Good to see you, Chase. We always appreciate Chess. Clayton Huron. Always a big supporter saying evening guys. Do you think the Broncos will be very aggressive in free agency or will they wait? And for the draft trade back, move up thoughts guys. I'm waiting to see on either of them, but what the Broncos do and how they behave in free agency is going to really influence my opinion of how they feel about this current core of veteran players. And even more importantly, Russell Wilson, if they are aggressive this off season, they pay some guys contracts that have big guarantees and huge dead caps hits down the line. They're all in on Cortland Sutton, uh, Justin Simmons, you know, Garrett Bowles, et cetera, Russell Wilson. But if they kind of kick the can down and they're a little bit more, I wouldn't say cheap, but frugal on this, you know, not signing got that first wave of free agency, maybe not even that second wave, signing street free agents and look playing more of the comp pick game. That to me says that this front office, Sean Payton, they're not in love with Russell Wilson and they are setting themselves in the best position possible to be flexible after the season where you might have to take on some serious dead cap 
uh, dead cap hits from moving on from Wilson. Right. Yeah. So pay attention to those first couple days. If Broncos aren't going crazy, probably means that Sean Payton's sitting there saying, I, I want to build for, for the next year. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, it seems like we've heard a lot more of the Broncos being linked to trading players than trading for players. Mm -hmm. Now, I get it. They don't have a whole lot of draft capital, so they're trying to get some of that back. But that makes me a little bit leery that they're kind of going, we need to get some draft capital. We need to build up the young players in this rosters that were ready for that 2024 kind of run. Yep. We got a guy, Richard, coming in saying, evening, Nick and Carl. Good to see you, Richard. Our guy, Ernie Mays, the one and only. Hello, Broncos country. Good to see you, Ernie. Appreciate you. David, the popping bear, uh, David McElrath coming in saying, evening, Broncos country. Nick, Carl, Dylan, Deacon Scott, Buckham, MHH for life. And we appreciate you. And also Michael coming in saying aggressive in the NFL free agency from GM George Payton and Sean Payton. We'll see. Uh, again, I believe it's either way is going to be indicative of how they feel about this current core of players because of the way all these contracts set up, uh, Garrett Bowles, especially uh, even Justin Simmons, uh, Cortland Sutton, Tim Patrick, Brandon McManus, all these contracts are set up in a way that you know, this year you have, you could save some money, but pretty big dead cap hits after mm -hmm. next season. So a year from now, those contracts are really easy uh, to move on from. And that's when you can have a complete overturn of the roster. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens. Phil McLaughlin always coming in supportive. Phil, we appreciate the heck out of you. Evening, Carl Nick and Deacon Scott. Since we didn't tag Draymond Jones, what do you think he's worth? MHH for life. Go Broncos and Buckham. Carl, everyone's favorite game. Guess that price. Uh, what is Draymond Jones going to get on the open market? I, man, it's so crazy. That first wave. There's always those shocking price tags that everybody's mm -hmm. like, oh, they'll, they'll only get this. And then they get like $5 million more per year yeah. than you thought they, they should be getting. So I, I'm going to put it there at that about $19 million per year. If he hits the open market. Okay. I was going to say 19 as well. Um, and I think it's going to be a four year deal from the Chicago bears about 19 million per year and 75% guaranteed bears have money to spend. Uh, Eberflus, his scheme bears head coach, been very dependent on interior pass rushers, versatile interior pass rushers there for those years of the Colts. So, and the bears have money to spend my God. Uh, so I think that's one that yeah, look out for them. Jetty splash. Hey, Jetty, how you doing? Good to see you as always. We got one of our favorite gals coming in. Jasmine saying evening guys. Good to see you, Jasmine and riptide coming back in saying release chase Edmonds, sign cream hunt and give him that money. Plus a little bit more, maybe a two year deal, like 7.5 mil per. That's the thing. I mean, you, you can pretty much pay for a running back on the market just by moving on from Chase Edmonds because that's with a 5.9 million. Like uh, Rip Ty says right here, toss on another 2 million. Right there, you got a, you can pay a quality starting running back, essentially the Melvin Gordon contract uh, that from whatever cycles ago, short term, paying them a lot of money. And I don't love it, but paying them short term uh, is something I'd be interested in doing. So like a two-year deal, 7.5 million per. I'm with you, Riptide. That's uh, that's one I'd be interested in. Not just Cream uh, Cream Hunt, though. I'd look at what the market looks like. Obviously, the best running back on the market was uh, zapped up in uh, Saquon Barkley. As soon as that deal was announced, about, like 10 seconds later, they're going to announce the, the tag on Saquon. There it was. Uh, did Jacobs didn't get tagged, correct? He did. Are you muted? Carl, I can't hear you. Yes, uh, sorry about that. Okay. Uh, yes, he did get tagged. Okay. Um, so the top three running backs all got tagged. Josh Jacobs, Tony uh, Pollard, Barkley. Yeah. And Tony Pollard. Mm -hmm. So probably the next kind of guys you're talking about, Kareem Hunt, Miles Sanders, David Montgomery. That's kind of that next tier of running backs that you're looking at that are going to get paid. And <clears throat> so the fact the Broncos are linked to those kind of guys mm -hmm. kind of shows they're looking for a starter quality kind of guy to come in. And we got our guy Patrick all the way from Hawaii coming in saying aloha, gents. Aloha to you as well there, Patrick. Good to always see you in here. And uh, then we got Adam Strange saying, how about inside off offensive line? Should the Broncos pay for a center or a guard? I really wanted to talk about this because I – sorry. I, I'm kind of excited about this idea. I, I was looking at an article of just Sean Payton's offense and his kind of thoughts of how he runs his scheme and – something that kind of stood out to me is they said, okay, he, he comes from like that West coast offense, you know, wanting that passing game that gets horizontal. And once teams really start creeping up, then you take it over the top. But something that he's added that a lot of teams didn't do before was he started really investing in the interior offensive line. And part of the reason he did that was because when teams started creeping up, it kind of stifled everything. 
you know, your run game wasn't able to go, your pass game struggled. And so you had to win over the top if you're going to be able to play. So it kind of limited what you could do. So what he started doing was really investing on the interior offensive line to say, we're going to be able to pound it down. We're going to get those four or five yards per carry, just run it straight up the middle. You know, you want to stop the pass game? That's what we're going to do. We're just going to, to bully you. And so there's some games that that's exactly what they would do. It's why they needed those two good running backs as well, that they could keep rotating just to keep that going. And you kind of see through their drafting, a lot of times their early picks were more towards in, interior guys, Andres Pete, uh, Cesar Ruiz, Ruiz. Um, uh, McCoy is another one. You know, th- those were within the last five or six years of first round picks used on interior offensive line. They also drafted Ben Grubbs really high, uh, whatever year that was, like one of the first picks in the second round. Uh, so, yeah, no, I'm with you. I, I noticed that as well. I don't. I think Andreas Pete was maybe a right tackle first, and then he kicked inside after he yeah. failed there right. uh, from Stanford, I want to say. But uh, I want to say Stanford. But, yeah, no, that's a, that's a good call, and I agree with you. And also it's something that matches well with what you probably have to do to maximize Russell Wilson at this point. So coming back around to Adam's point, uh, who should the Broncos pay guard center? Uh, do you have any names in mind or what do you, what are you thinking here? I'm trying to remember his name, the, the guard from, uh, from the Eagles, Isaac Simialu. Yeah. Simialu. I, I think he's probably the best guard hitting the market. It's not a great offensive guard free agency class, which is kind of unfortunate because probably the next guy would be like a Ben powers, maybe. Or Dalton Reisner. Or yeah, I know that's the that's the only problem there. Uh, got a couple centers, Connor McGovern. I've seen his name mentioned a couple times. Uh, Rodney Hudson. It sounds like he's going to retire. So mm-hmm. I know a couple people mentioned him as well. So I, I don't think he'll be an option. But honestly, I'd rather go to the draft for the center mm-hmm. because I think this is actually a pretty darn good center class, especially for those mid round picks. There's not like that top end guy. You know, there, there's not a a guy from Iowa coming in that's going to dominate at the center position. But but I think that third round is just really that sweet spot for about three or four guys that I think could actually be starters day one in the NFL and be a huge upgrade over what you've had with Lloyd Cushenberry, which, I mean, that's not saying much. It doesn't take much to get an upgrade at that point. Uh, But we got Phil McLaughlin coming in saying, hey, guys, should we go after Taylor McGlinchey or McGarry McGarry, uh, or should we just re-sign Anderson? So here's my thought, and I know this won't be anything exciting to to anybody out there, is I I do think that you go a little bit more investing on the interior offensive line. Mm -hmm. You sign whatever guard you can out of those top two guys, and then you're bringing in – I'm hoping that you can maybe – I don't know. I'd love to bring in at least a quality center at some point, at least a guy that can rotate and figure out something within there. And then Bowles, you're bringing him back at the right tackle position. Honestly, I'm probably going Fleming. Yeah, I, I would be fine with Fleming coming back. I think you do. A, you're still in the market for all three of these guys, but you have yeah. a price. What do you say? Like 13 to 15 million per year approaching them, probably 15 about. And uh, if that is not good enough for any of them, then you move on to the next year. Uh, but you're, you at least make the call. And if you're out of the market, you know, good luck to you. Uh, but I don't think you can way overspend to the point where then you have no money to spend on the interior offensive line. Uh, right. So that's my opinion on that. As far as re-signing Anderson, maybe uh, the issue with Anderson is he's a backup caliber offensive tackle who can really only play left tackle. Right. That's, that's not a good thing for a backup tackle or a backup offensive lineman in general. You need to be able to play two positions, three positions on the offensive line. If you're going to be a backup quality player. So probably Fleming played left tackle, played right guard, could play, uh, played, Right tackle, left tackle could also play guard as well. So I'd be more interested in him coming back as a plus swing uh, for your ability. And we also got Dark Iron uh, DID coming in here saying, uh, sorry, the first chat wanted to ask, hey, guys, our offense was terrible the past few years. Couldn't Sean Payton help our offensive line with guys we have or get guys that have been better, um, Judy, as well as others on the offense. Thank you so much, Dark. I wanted to make sure I came back around. Thank you for so much for your 999 one uh, earlier. All good. I'm glad we were able to get to you. I think coaching is going to really help the offense here. A lot of these guys being put in better situations uh, just by default. I also think with injury uh, help, you're going to be better next season on offense. I wouldn't expect the offense to be bottom five again next season, but you are still handcuffed with 
quarterback that you have, he could play better, but he's still your quarterback and he might be, you know, regressing some and also limited in how much you can turn around and turn over the roster given the resources that you have this season. So they'll be better. I think with Sean Payton and not just Sean Payton, but other guys you have in here, you'll be able to maximize what you have. But in the end, it is, in my opinion, still about the Jimmys and Joes. And it might take a little bit to get in the right Jimmys and Joes for Sean Payton. Right. And that's, it's a little bit of my hesitation to want to trade Cortland Sutton. Like I know he hasn't lived up to the hype these last couple of years, ever since his injury, he's just not quite been the same player, but I still think you get rid of him. It's hard to find a replacement level guy. That's going to actually bring even 80% of what he brings to the field. And with this offense, like I said, you need multiple weapons that you can just send wave after wave to make it work. Uh, and I just feel like if you hurt that position by taking one of the, the key pieces from the wide receiver room, I think it just makes things a lot more difficult. But we've got Chase Wellner coming in with a, a super chat saying, who is on your Raider for free agent players on the front four? You got any big names out there for us? I mean, big names would be Draymond Jones. Maybe you've heard of him if he came <laughs> back. Uh, but we'll see what happens. If not, you know, Javon Hargrave is also considered a really high end uh, pass rusher this cycle going to be 30 years old, but he was incredible this last season. Uh, David Anyamata uh, has connections to the saints. I'm guessing he probably is more likely to end up with the Falcons, but he's one they could approach as well. Uh, I'd be interested in somebody like uh, God, Marcus Davenport is probably one of the prime, uh, the prize jewels in this free agency uh, group uh, for defensive end. He's had some injuries, but a really supreme athlete. The name that really, I think you should have your eye on is probably Zach Allen. Uh, Cardinals inside outside pass rusher has familiarity with Vance Joseph had a really good season with uh, the Cardinals last season, probably one of the few um, that you can say had a good year uh, on that team last year and might be able to get him for 75% of what Draymond Jones is going to get. So I think Allen's the one who makes the most sense. Doesn't mean it'll happen, uh, but he's the one that's on my radar at least. Yeah. I, I think part of me believes that when they decided to not pay Draymond Jones, it really was when they brought in their defense coordinator and said, Hey, who do you want? I think he really was pointing towards his guy saying, I really want my guy. Hmm. I, I, I'm i just spitballing here. I, yeah. I really, I can't say that that's exactly what happened by any means. I just think a lot of times guys want who they know. And again, guys that know their scheme, that they don't have to coach them up. And you got one less starter to have to worry about getting them on, on the right page. We got Chris Fernandez coming in with some stars. Thank you so much, Chris. Always good to see you here. And Gary Nabor is coming in saying, uh, my it's his birthday here today as well. Happy birthday, Gary. Happy birthday, you. Gary. Everybody in the chat, let Gary know happy birthday. We always appreciate that. If you have a day to celebrate, then, uh, you know, we definitely want to celebrate with you. Just like Scott's celebrating his wife's birthday today. Uh, so oh, happy birthday to everybody. Uh, Pisces, I believe, whatever. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not into that. Uh, Clayton Huron, I've asked a few times. Thoughts on bringing back no-fly zone. We have two shutdown corners, and I think we added one more. Linebackers played great last year as well. I think that having the no-fly zone would be great, but your resources are probably going to be utilized in improving the offense and the the defense. I'd be If you have a cornerback, you I mean, you already have two pieces of your five and a half on the, in the secondary that would qualify as no, no fly zone caliber in my book in Sertan and Simmons, but you probably need one more one level cornerback out there to do that. And by doing so, are you demoting one of your biggest cost benefit players you have on the entire roster going into next season in a looks like a starting caliber cornerback in Demario Mathis on a fourth round player salary. It'd be great to have the no fly zone, but you got to think a little bit cost analysis as well. And with how Demario Mathis played last season, and how cheap he is for the next three seasons. Do you want to invest in that cornerback room and put him on the bench? I'm not against it, but it's, you have, you have a finite amount of resources and avenues to improve this team. So I would assume they go probably cheaper at the cornerback spot opposite of Sertan next year. Maybe draft somebody, you know, just add depth to the room. You always want to have, you know, it's adding logs to the fire in the secondary offensive line, defensive line. You always want to make an investment in there annually, but uh, I, I don't know. I just can't imagine that when you have Demari Mathis playing league average, but for super freaking cheap. Right. Yeah, that's a huge advantage. And I also think he's a very good fit in this Vance Joseph scheme. Mm -hmm. His ability to play man coverage down the field, like he wants to be aggressive. He wants to be that that man that get one on one with his guy and see what he can do. He's got that dog in him to, to want to be that kind of guy. So I, mm -hmm. I think 
if I'm the Broncos, I'm sitting there saying I feel pretty good with him being that starter opposite of Patrick Sertan for this next year. You know, we, we can kind of kick that bucket down the road. We can give him another year, see what he's got. If it if he develops even more, great. We've got another guy for another few years here, all both of them, that are just going to be a great tandem. If not, yeah. then we can look at that position later on. And like I said, I still think you add to the position in the draft because mm-hmm. this is actually a pretty darn good cornerback draft. They're huge. Got some, it's yeah. like the biggest <laughs> cornerback group of all time, like size-wise. Yeah. It's, it's wild. Um, right. You know, I, I, I joked that uh, the guy from K-State, Brents, I don't think he has to even move, and he covers a third of the field. Yeah, he's He's long. what, six foot four? Has one of the biggest wingspans out there. Can jump out of the gym. His agilities so, were insane too, which is crazy yeah. for the physics, right? The center of gravity is higher. But a uh, couple coming in back to back. Tom uh, Lock Lockhoff coming in here. Tom, I see you in here all the time. If I'm mispronouncing your name, let me know. Hit me up on Twitter. I'm more likely to see it there. But they'd go after Dante Foreman cheap. He also says uh, Connor McGovern and Ben Powers eight million each. Broncos going to pay some offensive linemen, no doubt. I got to ask you though, Tom, which Connor McGovern? Because I'm pretty sure that both of them are free agents. <laughs> as confusing, you might as well sign both of them, right? That way, one of them. God, what do you even do at that point? Uh, I guess you identify them by their number. That's there you go. Easy <laughs> for football. Uh, what is it? Penn State, Missouri. Come on, get over here. Get, get your butts over here. But uh, appreciate the comments. Greg Smith coming in here saying, um, good evening, Broncos country. Um, Heath Holmes saying, Nick, I got to congratulate you for not saying 100% hardly the last three weeks. See, in- capable of improvement. Trying real hard on that. <laughs> Um, CIA, CIA come in with some names for center, uh, Ethan Pokasik or Austin Blythe, Austin Blythe retired as you say here. So unfortunate on that one. Uh, but what can you do? Don't want to miss anybody's super chats here. Sorry. I'm running this on the back end, uh, with Scott gone. So Carl, help me out here. If anybody, uh, come in, especially on Facebook, okay. um, Tom, uh, also comes back in saying, I'd rather pay two interior offensive linemen than pay McG- McGlinchey 16 million a year. I'd rather have two good guys over a paid tackle. Fleming did fine. Fleming was fine. Again, I would be interested in approaching the market there i think 14 to 16 million per year for that the thing is if you're paying a right tackle that amount of money i think that is a probably a nail in the coffin for garrett bulls you have both of them next season but you have whatever right tackle you pay this season his cap hit is going to be low that's just kind of how they work a lot of these contracts out but his cap hit would be low and then when it would balloon in 2024 you're probably saying sayonara uh to garrett bulls and looking for a cheaper cost controlled option on the other side which not saying that's the wrong pathway, but that's something you got to think about. It's not, oh, we have tackles set now for a while. You're probably rotating that expense onto the right side with a younger cost-controlled upside player on the left side. So Robert right. here to pay Paul, maybe. Yeah, no, I'm with you there. I think if you can get like a Juwan Taylor for 15 million, 16 million, I'm okay with it. I mean, because mm-hmm. I think he is a high quality player. I think he's got a great all-around game. I think he's one of the few players that I just, I'd really feel good paying some decent money for on the offensive line. If his knee is okay. He suffered a meniscus injury in 2016. I want to say maybe it was 2018. Wait, what year is it even? Maybe 2018 in Florida. So that kind of caused him to fall, but that's the one that scares me a bit just because I still have a Juwan James uh, PTSD. Yeah. I think he's a little bit different because he's actually played every year where. Yeah. He, (laughs) I, what was it? Every other year. Yeah, for and then, and then it was no years, right? Yeah, then we got that. Uh, but we got Dark Iron D coming back saying, <laughs> "Yes, my point with Court and other guys like we've got to get rid of a lot of players." To be honest, a player like Noah Fant could have been the next Shannon Sharp. I feel like we should keep a bit of our guys and see. Yeah, I'm willing to keep Cortland Sutton because I mean we've seen when he's when he's right, he's a good player, mm-hmm. and I think part of the problem is we haven't seen him in a good scheme. So I kind of wonder what we what he's going to be able to do in a Sean Payton scheme of a guy that knows how to get guys open to get him advantageous matchups and allow him to do a lot of that yards after catch that he's pretty darn good at as well. I mean, he's good at the sky ball and all that kind of stuff, but I think I think he's a very underrated yards after catch guy in this NFL. We've got Amy coming in saying, good evening, Broncos country. Good evening to you as well there, Amy. And Michael coming back with some blue and orange hearts. Good to see you there, Michael. Good shirt that you're wearing there. Uh, make sure you guys head over to our, our swag shop so you don't miss anything that we have over there. I think that's where we got the shirt. And we got Phil coming in and saying, should we go after Moreau, Dan Arnold, or Irv Smith Jr. for the tight end position? I love Foster Moreau. Um, I if I don't know if you remember, I kind of had 
scroll down. Uh, that, uh, draft happened when the Raiders took him. But uh, any of these names, Carl? Uh, I mean, in that second wave of free agents, if they're available, then maybe you, you sign for a, another tight end. Because, again, I, I know that's something that Sean Payton wants to do. Is he wants to be able to have that two tight end set if he can. Just because there are going to be some games where that's the more advantageous look. And so having two tight ends that can get on the field and do something. And, and you need you need some other options for the Broncos right now at the tight end position. You, you just you haven't had much lately. I mean, you got your rookie that played pretty darn good when healthy. But again, you got that caveat of when healthy. Can he play a full 17-game season? We don't know yet. So uh, we got Glenn coming in saying, do you think we are kicking ourselves taking Chubb ahead of Quentin Nelson? I don't know. I mean, that Colts offensive got some... line last year was trash. They were God awful and they had the highest paid guard in football and it did them no good. I mean, the one game where the Broncos offensive line actually, I was like, oh, maybe we're not so bad. Was that Colts game, whatever week that was when Baron Browning had like 52 pressures. Uh, yeah. What Quentin Nelson's good. Broncos were able to get a first round return and Bradley Chubb got a contract bigger than Quentin Nelson, which means that he's more valuable. So I don't know if that's a, uh, I don't, I wouldn't say that we're kicking ourselves for that. If you're kicking yourselves for anything in that draft, it's not taking, you know, Josh Allen or one of those quarterbacks or Jair Alexander or some, somebody like that. But, uh, right. Quentin Nelson, really good player, still a guard. And because he's a singular player on the offensive line at a lesser valuable position on that offensive line, even if he's the best guard in football, if the guys around him aren't very good, then the offensive line still sucks. Right. Where Bradley Chubb, he's one of those players that, he could have terrible players around him and still be a great player that impacts the game. Yeah. We've got Greg Smith saying, good evening, Broncos country, Denver Broncos for life. Good to see you there, Greg. And Jason Keller coming in saying, Dan Arnold, he has connections to Joseph. Yeah, out there with Arizona. We'll see uh, what happens with them. I really like Foster Moreau. We'll see. Uh guy from Louisiana state uh, we're number 18 at uh, Louisiana state as well, which they vote on and give to like their team captains, both on and off the field that exemplify excellence. So I always love that uh, when you find little tidbits like that for players who are voted by their own peers as people, but uh, we'll see. And we got William Cantalano coming in here saying, do the Broncos get a compensatory pick for Draymond Jones? We won't know that until after free agency is over. And we won't even know exactly which one it is until later on. I don't even think the compensatory picks for 2023 have been announced yet. Uh, so those will be announced here pretty soon uh, for, and those are from last year's free agency class. So probably the Broncos, if they really wanted to go that route and try to maximize the revenue, get a third, probably a third round comp pick for Draymond Joe's, uh, then they can, you know, make sure they don't pay an equivalent level contract, uh, make sure that they're more so dabbling in the street free agent market this year. So guys who were released, not ones who contracts contracts expired, but, uh, we won't know that for a year from now. We can kind of guess based on how the Broncos attack free agency this year, but won't know for a bit. It's a question just because we had talked about Javon Hargrave earlier. So guys that had voided years, would they count against the, the comp pick formula? I think they would because they were not released from their contract. It was always a, a the way the contract was set up to have those money years added on to the deal. I'm not sure though. We're entering a weird area, but that's just me making a educated guess. There's a difference between a player being released versus a contract that was agreed upon with voided years on it. Okay. Cause I'm trying to remember the Broncos ran into that a little bit. It was an uh, option. It wasn't a voided year and the Broncos. Oh, that's right. So the Broncos did not extend the option or exercise the option on Russell Okung. And instead of, the NFL looking at the single year contract uh, that Russell Okung ended up playing. They looked at the average per year of the entire contract, which changed it from like a fifth round, equally in a fifth round compact to equally in a third round compact, which right. sucked in hindsight because uh, the Broncos yeah, lost the third round compact that year. Uh, but uh, no, I think the void years are a part of it. And uh, I would not uh, expect them to be street free agents. Yeah. So yeah, I'm with you there. So Carl, we got about 10 minutes left or so. Uh, I want to ask you, I've had a lot of chance to talk about it, but the combine happened this week and you and I first, you know, came together with our love about the NFL draft 
surrounding the Denver Broncos. So got to have your takeaways. Uh, combines, anybody standing out for you? Obviously, the Broncos don't have any top picks, but uh, there was still, you know, a lot of talent that showed up there in India, a lot of rumors swirl, a lot of drinks, you know, swirled as well. Uh, but um, any thoughts uh, coming out of the combine? Anybody who caught your eye, people that if we were running mock drafts, ones that would be, you'd be pounding the table for. I know before the year we have that, giant monster of a combined MHH coming in together of the brains uh, mock draft, or maybe somebody has a brain in there, not me. Uh, but uh, I won't say that, you know, brain of Carl, but uh, what are your thoughts on the combine? Anybody stand out to you that you're really interested in? Well, I mean, you'd be happy to hear this name, Jack Campbell. Okay. Definitely did himself. Well, um, linebacker out of Iowa, you know, if Broncos are looking for a big guy in the middle to be that, you know, alpha dog there, that's kind of the, the leader moving forward. I'm not sure what the Broncos are all going to do at the the linebacker position, uh, they'll bring back Singleton or not. Mm -hmm. But if they decide to to move on from him, Jack Campbell there in that third, fourth round, man, he he looked pretty darn good for a guy that yeah. most kind of thought would be not not as limited athletically, but still there there's going to be maybe some at, some limitations, I guess I would say. Um, he ran a sub Obviously, four seven, which is the big number you're looking for for linebackers. Granted that right. it was a fast track uh, there at Indy the last couple years, but his explosiveness drills, his jumps, uh, broad and vertical, and then his twitch for a six foot five linebacker in terms of the agilities of the twenty yard shuttle and the three cone, really really outstanding. Uh, add to the top of that, not to you know to get too much on this horse, but like he was beloved in Iowa City by that coaching staff. So. If he's there, I'm with you, Carl. I just, I know linebackers devalued these days. I'm the one driving that bus as much as anybody. I'm going to be pretty damn shocked if he's there at pick 67 or 68. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. Um, you know, obviously the, the tight ends did themselves pretty darn well throughout this. So liking the chances of the Broncos, you know, if they want to add to that tight end room in the draft, I'm going to be okay with that. Yeah. Because again, having two good tight ends on this roster only adds to the offense and what they can do. Um, obviously you're not going to go get a Darnell Washington because he's going to go higher than, than what you could get out there. Um, I'd say some of the offensive tackles obviously helped themselves with being very long, very tall, very big, very fast, all those kind of things. Um, I know a guy that we had talked about and I'm going to butcher his name, uh, Adeta Tomua. Oh my gosh. I really but butchered that. Uh, from Northwestern, the edge player. Adi Adi. Yes, there we go. Adi Adi. We'll go with that. Um, probably took himself out of the running for the Broncos, unfortunately, mm -hmm. with the, the combine that he had. I was really hoping maybe he'd be one of those guys that made it to the third round for the Broncos. But unfortunately, it's just not going to be the case anymore. So just a few names out there. Um, it, it was a very athletic class. That, that cornerback group, like you said, big, tall, fast, very athletic guys. And some of them really shocked me, I guess I would say that I'm going to have to go back now and watch them a little bit more. Cause I'm like, did they really show that on the field that they were that athletic? Some of them, I don't think they really did. And, mm -hmm. and I'm kind of starting to think that this might be one of those draft classes that they're more athletes than football players, because I really don't think most of these guys showed quite that well. Yeah. You know, heading into the combine, we were talking about how this was kind of a down year for the draft. And then coming out of the combine, we're going, oh my gosh, they just broke all these records everywhere. Every, you know, pretty much every position had some guy break a new record for their position. Mm -hmm. And so again, I think they're better athletes than they are football players, which means probably going to have to let these guys develop for a year. Yeah. And it's a smaller class at the top than normal as far as the, just the underclassmen because of the NIL going on at the college level and that's just a reality of what's the what's happening at the top. But I think there's, you know, a good amount of talent in the top 75. I mean, as George Payton said, right, the sweet spot of this draft is yeah. uh, right at the beginning of the third round. Uh, so <laughs> but uh, sweet spot of this draft has been Tom coming in here. Another super 499 saying I don't want the Broncos to get rid of Sutton. But with a wide, wide receiver market being led by Jacoby Myers, teams might pay up. Uh, so yeah, Claypool got second round pick, not only just second round pick, pick 32 overall. Uh, and Sutton is more proven. Yeah, I think you could probably get a mid-second round pick for Sutton if you wanted to trade him, and that's something uh, we had Lindsey Jones mention it a couple weeks ago that the Broncos might be, you know, not shopping, but listening to offers for Carlton yeah. Sutton. And then uh, Matthew Barry also said so uh, coming out of his 23 tidbits from the combine that he heard that Carlton Sutton is potentially 
uh, being shopped right now. So yeah. we'll see what happens with them. I think something to keep in mind with the Sean Payton offense. I mean, I know Michael Thomas put up some big numbers, mm-hmm. but he wouldn't be like that true, like number one guy. Cause he, he played a lot more in the slot than that true outside guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you look at his offenses there, a lot of times he hasn't had just that true elite number one. He'd rather have about four number twos on the field than a, a true number one. Just again, because he can play a lot more matchup football and figure out where he can take advantage of that. And so, yeah, if you can get a second for Sutton, I, I mean, I'd entertain it. Hmm. It's hard not to. Yeah. And and you're right. The wide receiver market, the, the free agent class, horrible. This draft class, okay. A lot of twos and threes. Yeah. So if a team is sitting there saying, we'd really love that true number one outside. Well, he's not uh, number one, but like a good outside guy. For relatively cheap because right. how the contract is set up. Like he'd be, even if let's say he's a wide receiver three, he'd be a bargain uh, for what his contract is for whatever team trades for him. Yeah. So, so I, I do think you can probably get a decent offer. I think that'd probably be closer to the draft than it will be right now. Kind of trade where teams want to get through this free agent period, figure out what they're going to do. And then as we get closer to the draft, maybe make that kind of move. But uh, we got Todd coming in saying, hello, Broncos family. Hello to you as well there, Todd. Also got our guy, Richie Rich, saying, been a while. Carl Nick, hope you're doing well. And then he's teasing me, saying uh, Broncos should trade up for a running back. Richie Rich, don't tease <laughs> me. If it's B. John Robinson or Jameer Gibbs, no, nah, you can't do it. You can't do it. Uh, Clayton Huron saying, just for the, uh, just for the you two tonight, you guys nailed it. Great work. Thanks so much, Clayton. Uh, we have been nailing it. I'm glad somebody realized it. Uh, <laughs> we got Divine's Breaks coming in saying, hey, hey, wouldn't mind a late draft pick on tight end Tucker Craft out of San Diego or South Dakota State. Excuse me. South Dakota State, the Jackrabbits. Uh, I don't think it's going to be a late round draft pick for Tucker Craft. I think he's going to go somewhere in the top 120 picks. I'm saying yep. if he's, you're picking the fourth round, I'd get it. Honestly, I don't think I'd use pick 76 or seven, excuse me, 77 and 78 on him. Uh, but what is it? 90 or 108 or something right now. We It'll be lower once the comp picks are announced, but uh, fourth round. Yes. I'd, I'd be okay with it. Yeah. Like I said, the tight ends did excellent down there at the combine mm-hmm. and coming into the combine. Like it was one of the stronger positions. Like it was one of those I'm going, yeah, I, I kind of like this class. It, so it's something where it matched what you see on, on the field in a lot of ways. Yeah. And like I said, Tucker craft probably going to go earlier than, than what the Broncos would hope. And Divine coming in and saying he worked for me in Brookings. Great guy. Well, that's good to hear. I was pretty sad um, week one this year when he, uh, he got hurt early on versus Iowa because I wanted to see some Jack Campbell on that Iowa defense versus uh, Tucker Craft. And I think South Dakota State ended up winning uh, the their level of football's conference championship this year. So congrats, man. That Jackrabbits team has been pretty, pretty good out there. Everybody th- talks about North Dakota State, but South Dakota State too, also a powerhouse. So uh, Carl, back to your... Uh, Combine talk here before we start to wrap it on up. Anybody else catch your eye? You talked a lot about uh, some guy, anybody, you know, specifically with the Broncos, you know, we can talk about some of those pets in day three, late day three, but guys, you were coming out of the combine. You're like, okay, these are names that I really am interested in for the Broncos and pick 67 or 77. I wish 67, 77 and seven. Oh, wait, 67 and 68. I'm right. Cause they don't have pick 69. Everyone cry, but 67 and 68. <laughs> yeah. So I've kind of mentioned before of I'm really big into the um, the Broncos going heavy in free agency towards the the offensive side of the ball and then going to the draft saying, hey, we're going to go get some of these really athletic guys uh, that I think can really help on <clears throat> on the defensive side. Um, so some names that I really like. You got to I'm trying to remember a few of these. Let me. Julius Brents is one that I mentioned earlier at that cornerback position. Again, you got another big guy on the outside, uh, Isaiah Foskey. I don't know if he'll make it to the Broncos pick there at the edge position, but kind of a bigger guy doesn't have much bend, but he can be your power guy off the edge that really holds well for the run game. And I'm trying to remember a few others here. Um, Any wide receivers? I mean, there's been some talk. We talked about Carlton Sutton maybe being moved. And I think it was Ben Albright that mentioned that don't sleep on the Broncos potentially taking a speed wide receiver at uh, in the third round. If one, they like falls to them. Are there any wide receivers? I've said it on my show a few times, uh, but I am, he's not a speed wide receiver per se, but I think Cedric Tillman is a dude. 
I think that if he was not, didn't suffer that high ankle sprain this year, we'd be talking about him being a top 40 pick. He still might be a top 40 pick, uh, but I really like Cedric Tillman. Yeah. A.T. Perry is another one that did himself well at the combine. Big guy, 6'5", 205 pounds, if I remember right, from Wake Forest. I think he would be a a pretty good pick for the Broncos. Rashi Rice is another guy that kind of fits that same mold, 6'3", 206. I'm not sure where those guys will quite end up. Derek Hall is another guy for the defense that I'd love there at the edge position. Mm -hmm. Just has that consistent, like, just always going kind of guy. Uh, Love watching that on, on film. And then... Some interior guys, that's where this is just not a great defensive line class. There's not many guys that I yeah. really, really like. More like some Ajomo. versatile inside outside guys. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Some Ajomo is one. Um, Auburn also. Uh, Wooden interests me a good bit as an inside outside kind of player. Uh, but um, yeah, it's not the best interior defensive line class. There's some, but it's not a very deep class. Gina Cooper. I see we had some South Dakota State Jackrabbits in here saying, let's go represent. Also, Roy Osborne saying South Dakota State won the national championship for the FCS, live in Sioux Falls. Go blue, uh, go big, go blue, go Jacks. You guys are great. Uh, appreciate you coming in. And Jesse coming in saying, awesome job tonight, guys. Great commentary and chat. My favorite pod. Well, that's really nice of you to say. MHH, always one of the best parts of my day. Well, Jesse, we appreciate that. We appreciate everybody coming in. And Divine saying, yeah, they did win the national championship. So that's great. Um, yeah. Definitely remember, well, I think they spanked North Dakota State too. Uh, and then Sting guy coming in here. Carl, you want to take this one and then we'll wrap it on up? Yeah, he says, I think you could get compensatory picks if you tag Draymond Jones, but I'm not sure. I was hoping Carl will explain why we can't tag and trade him. Well, one, the tag and trade period has ended today. So the Broncos had to have that done by 4 p.m. Eastern. They decided not to tag Draymond Jones, and they pretty much made that decision that he's going to be able to hit the market. And if he doesn't get what he wants, maybe he'd come back to the Broncos, take their offer, but I'm guessing he'll get what he wants and more. So, again, the Broncos, I think, kind of messed this up, and if they do go for the compensatory pick, it limits what they can do of who they sign. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I don't blame them if they decide to go in that kind of direction, where they're trying to get as many draft picks and kind of set up again more of a 2024 run than looking here at this 2023 year. But to me, that'd be a little bit of a sign, again, that they're probably not thinking this is going to be the best season. Yeah. We'll see how it plays out. Uh, But Carl, that's going to have to do it for us. Tuesday night, we did it. Hopefully we didn't miss anybody on the Facebook side of things. You guys are great. Uh, sting guy. Thanks for that comment coming in. And thanks everybody uh, for coming in and supporting the show today. You guys are great. Uh, Also Benjamin Flores coming in last minute evening, men. Thanks for all you do to keep us Broncos oriented all year round, all year round. Indeed. Uh, We appreciate it. This is a great time of year. Um, Hope Springs eternal in uh, March with the free agency and the Broncos are going to have some new players and Broncos are going to get better uh, over the next couple months. So it's always fun to do that. Make sure you guys are following Carl and I on Twitter. Carl is at Carl Dumbler MHH. I'm at Nick Kendall MHH. Also follow us at BFB pod and at mile high huddle. If you haven't done so yet, join us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash mile high huddle and facebook.com forward slash mile high huddle pod. And as the ticker says underneath here, if you're joining us on YouTube today, please subscribe to the channel, mile high huddle, like the show, like the channel and share it on your social medias. Every once in a while, I'll see one of you that I follow on Instagram, see that you clip the show. I'm like, Oh my God, that's my face on this person's Instagram story. What's going on? (laughs) But uh, always appreciate that. When you do that, Uh, it helps us get the word out there and continue to add to this amazing community. You guys are great. Uh, again, we'll see Scott again tomorrow morning, tomorrow night, uh, but he's taking the night off. So everybody, you know, wish Skyler uh, a happy birthday out there. Scott's out there cooking and taking care of the family. So good for him. Glad he could have the day off. And Carl, always fun to hang out with you. What are your plans the rest of the day? What are you looking forward to? Uh, not not too much going on. I got a, I, I do have a run to go for. I'm getting back into that and trying to get going and got, got some training that I've, My wife and I are trying to do some training and push each other to get back in shape. You know, as you get older, you got to be in shape just just to wake up in the morning sometimes. You know, I I read something the other day about how, you know, as a kid, you could pretty much sleep wherever you wanted. As an adult, you have to have three pillows just to wake up in the morning and not be able to move kind of thing. So uh, we're kind of in that age group now. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm becoming an old guy. I don't but, think you're that much older than me, Carl. That scares me. I, know. I, I, I'm I got giving, like back. I'm showing you your future. 
Oh God, I hope not. I got <laughs> big backpacking plans. I got to get out there. I want to like climb some 14ers or maybe climb Mount Rainier here coming up, but uh, appreciate you guys, everyone in the chat. You guys have been great. I really appreciate everybody coming in here and not being toxic today, adding to the conversation. You guys are awesome. Um, uh, make sure that just like you did in the chat today and you did all day today, I'm sure continue to choose kindness and compassion. And, uh, as always go Broncos.